everyone. Here we are live from Guernic Academy of Medical Arts in Modesto, California, reading about diabetes and hypoglycemia. I apologize I didn't get this, uh, this chapter out to you earlier, but it is a long, big chapter full of information. And what I tried to do was narrow it down to important information that you need to know. Um, it's good to know everything, of course. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we knew everything in the whole world? But there are a lot of questions on NCLEX or in NCLEX on diabetes. So it is an important disease to know about and try to understand. It's also important, as you know how I feel, that I want you to be healthy. I want your family to be healthy. I want your family's extended family to be helpful, healthy. Um, so this just isn't about our patients. And heaven knows many of our patients are going to have diabetes. And they might become hypoglycemic. And we are going to have to know how to help them in emergencies and what to do with insulin. Why are they getting insulin? What kind of insulin are they getting? Oh, it goes on and on and on, right? So where do we start? We have to start somewhere. Let's start with basics and build up. And you are going to have to learn a little on your own. I can't teach you everything, but I will teach you important things to know. Um, there's a lot in the book. So do read your book, do listen to this um, lecture several times. Um, and it, why do I keep saying um, 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 sorry. So just hang on tight and let's get going with this lecture. Okay, nice to see everybody. All right, this is just a lesson plan, but I will suggest that you need to know about hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. You need to know the types, type 1 and type 2, what it means. I don't really talk about gestational diabetes in this lecture. It's not in the book. But um, you do, I know you do have to do uh, something on gestational, so you'll have to look that up. I'll try to put a little bit in here about that. Uh, the role of insulin in the body you need to know and understand. And, uh, of course, as I said, you might need to develop a nursing plan for a patient with diabetes. You will encounter a lot of diabetics at the facilities. This is a picture of your pancreas. It's a cross-section. So notice how the pancreas uh, is slightly under the stomach. And remember that part of the pancreas is digestive enzymes. That's the exocrine part of the pancreas. That makes the digestive enzymes for um, digestion. And that empties into the small intestine. Also, um, the alpha cells secrete glucagon. The delta cells secrete somatostatin. And we have discussed that. Uh, the beta cells secrete insulin. There's a lot of them there. And then the exocrine uh, glands in the pancreas, as I mentioned, um, for digestion. So this is just a cross-section. Then the other interesting thing about pancreas is it has a tail and it has a head. And there are different types of cancers that might attack the head or the tail. So when you hear pancreatic cancer, that's not enough information. You need to know is it head or tail. One grows faster than the other. One can be not cured, but can you can last longer, live longer, have a longer life um, with pancreatic cancer. All right. So these are just some things I'm going to be talking about, pathophysiology, cause, risk factors, complications, medical diagnosis, and the medical treatment of diabetes and hypoglycemia. So this is just some immunological causes of diabetes. Notice that it's all about antibodies. So the body um, is 
trigger some antibodies processes taking place and I will be talking about that um, need you to know these two words endogenous insulin produced by one's own body and exogenous means that your insulin comes from an external source such as an injection or maybe you're not getting insulin orally but you do take something for um, hyperglycemia so you might be taking a medication that's exogenous so be sure you know the difference and I know these words have cropped up in a lot of um, illnesses so know the difference all right so let's talk about type 1 uh, type 1 is the absence of endogenous insulin formerly called juvenile onset diabetes because it most commonly occurs in juveniles and young adults now I'd like to tell a little bit of story here and that is I had a friend who had like this 13 year old son very very active in sports playing basketball and he was eating a lot right eating a lot because he was hungry he was so active but he was also losing weight well he's a growing boy he's losing weight he's eating a lot because he's hungry because he's active but don't really know was he peeing a lot did he have the three p's polyuria polyphagia polydipsia well probably but as a juvenile you know the teenagers they aren't home a lot they eat their pizzas and you don't really know what they're eating um, or if they're eating at all and then they start losing weight but by the time this young man was found out to have diabetes type 1 uh, his glucose was 350 so kind of I think that's how it sort of got its name kind of sort of think of gotta <laughs> putting all those words in sorry um, so it's an autoimmune process possibly triggered by a viral infection but the important thing you need to know here about type 1 is it destroys beta cells remember that picture with the beta cells that secretes the insulin well in type 1 those beta cells get destroyed the development of insulin antibodies and the protection of islet cell antibodies and these affected people require exogenous insulin for the rest of their lives so these are the ones that are going to be on insulin forever all right so type 2 now I'm going I've got some papers in my hand so um, if you hear me rustling that's what it is and I'll also be using the book uh, so type 2 we need to know about uh, inadequate endogenous insulin and body's inability to properly use insulin the beta cells respond inadequately to hyperglycemia results in chronically elevated blood glucose continuous high glucose level in the blood desensitizes the beta cells this is important to know um, they become less responsive to elevated glucose so the islet cells are the beta cells are not stimulated to release insulin when there's high glucose in the blood so type 2 um, oral pills are given which increases the cell sensitivity to insulin so these patients are on pills they might eventually need insulin exogenous insulin but hopefully this type can be controlled by diet and exercise so that's important to know so we need to know that uh, the beta cells are desensitized in type 2 in type 1 they're not working they've been destroyed by maybe uh, an illness a viral infection right or um, some antibodies that have been developed sometimes it runs in the family we'll find that out as we move along so what is the role of insulin to glucose well insulin stimulates active transport of glucose into the cells if insulin is absent glucose remains in the bloodstream blood becomes thick which increases osmolarity oh boy these words 
that we've learned, right? Active transport, osmolarity. We've learned these words that we've been coming along. We've, we're building up that pyramid of knowledge. So increased osmolarity stimulates thirst center, right? Polydipsia. As blood passes through the kidneys, some glucose is eliminated. So you get polyuria, you get glucose in the urine. So your three Ps, polyphagia, hunger, polyuria, urinating. Free, poly means a lot, right? And polydipsia, eating and drinking a lot. Polyphagia, eating, polyuria, peeing or urinating, and polydipsia, um, drinking a lot. So these are the three Ps. So in this lecture, when I mentioned PPP, that's what I'm referring to. So uh, the patient usually takes in more food, but cannot use the extra glucose without insulin. So um, that's important to know that the patient takes in more food, but unfortunately cannot use the extra glucose without insulin and the body's not given up the insulin. So what happens? Weight loss. Weight loss occurs despite increased appetite and food ingestion, like the story I told you of the young uh, teenager. Also, insulin regulates the rate of glucose metabolism. You need to understand this process of glycogen being converted to glucose in diabetics and the process of glycogenolysis. So the bottom statement there, um, I know I'm giving you more information because I'm going from my notes than is on the slides itself, but it's a double good thing. All right, um, so again, insulin regulates the rate of glucose metabolism and understand that glycogenolysis, glycogen being converted to glucose Okay, next thing. The role of insulin in fatty acids. Well, this is important because um, increased fatty acids can lead to coronary heart disease. So let's read this slide here. So uh, fatty acids promotes fatty acid synthesis and converts conversion of fatty acids into fat, which is stored as adipose tissue also spares fat by inhibiting breakdown of oops adipose tissue and mobilization of fat and by inhibiting the conversion of fat to glucose so the fat normally can be broken down into glucose but in this case it cannot it, the fat hangs around and without adequate insulin fat stores breakdown and increased triglycerides are stored in the liver. So fat store breakdown and increased triglycerides are stored in the liver. So it's not really broken down. Um, so important here to know is that increased fatty acids in the liver can triple the production of lipoproteins. It promotes atherosclerosis. That's why patients with insulin have coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, stroke. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. But I want you to understand why this leads to problems later on down the line. And notice it doesn't happen right away. It's a buildup. So increased fatty acids in the liver can triple the production of lipoproteins, promotes atherosclerosis and that's why the diabetic patients have a higher incidence of um, cardiovascular disease so that's important to know so let's move on to another thing protein so protein it enhances protein synthesis in tissues and inhibits conversion of protein into glucose without adequate insulin protein storage halts and large amounts of amino acids are dumped into the bloodstream so what does that mean 
Well, high levels of plasma amino acids place people with diabetes at risk for gout. And changes in protein metabolism lead to extreme weakness and poor organ functioning. An autoimmune malfunction causes complete destruction of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, sorry, misspelled, creating type 1 diabetes. Uh, just want to say the cause again, an autoimmune malfunction may cause complete destruction of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, creating type 1 diabetes. Islet cell antibodies are identified in more than 80% of all people with type 1 diabetes at the time of diagnosis. That's interesting. So here's some risk factors. Let's look at those. These are risk factors for developing diabetes. So obesity, sedentary lifestyle, family history of diabetes, age 40 years and older, history of gestational diabetes. There's our ding, ding, ding. That's our diabetes uh, from pregnancy. History of delivering infant weighing more than 10 pounds. So that again, diabetic women do have babies that are big. Um, that gestational diabetes, they do check for that, um, doing the glucose tolerance tests and some other tests. Uh, always checking pregnant women for gestational diabetes because they want to catch that early and treat it because it can lead to birth defects. So there is a higher incidence of birth defects in gestational diabetic, diabetes women and their um, babies. African American, 33% higher risk for type 2 diabetes. Latin American or Hispanic, greater than 300% higher risk for type 2 diabetes. It doesn't disparage between uh, ethnicities, does it? It's just all over the place. American Indians, 33 to 50% higher risk for type 2 diabetes. I won't go into any political comments at this point. Polycystic ovary syndrome. That's interesting. And look, cardiovascular disease and hypertension. Well, that's pretty important because we, we see that. We're going to be talking about it multiple times in this lecture. And so I don't want you to forget. Um, hypertension can lead to diabetes. And patients with diabetes can have liver, not liver, kidney problems, which can lead to hypertension. So it's kind of a whole merry-go-round of uh, problems that diabetics can have. And then the presence of acanthos, niagrins, and other conditions um, associated with insulin resistance. Let's talk about risk factor more, metabolic syndrome. This is really interesting, I think. And I think Modesto, the Central Valley is full of metabolic syndrome patients. It is thought, and I'm here, I live here, so I'm not judging, I'm just calling it out. Um, metabolic syndrome thought to be a precursor to diabetes. It's impaired glucose tolerance, high serum insulin, not being used, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, and remember, we want a high HDL normally. Uh, altered size and density of the LDL or lipoprotein. So um, believe that metabolic syndrome is a chronic low-grade inflammatory process. And they that inflammatory process, are they're saying that that could be diabetes. They're saying um, even COVID is part of an inflammatory process. Heart disease is part of an inflammatory process. So brush your teeth, because it all starts in the mouth. Inflammation of the gums can start there and spread to the rest of the body. Take good care of your teeth. Um, eat well. Try to keep inflammation down in your body. All right. Um, lecture, right? 
Long-term effects, atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, left ventricle hypertrophy, and type 2 diabetes. All right, so um, that long-term effects, atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, and which could lead to hypertension, um, and type 2 diabetes. So research is directed at learning how to detect this syndrome. They're even finding it in children now. Uh, they're trying to detect the syndrome early and what interventions might slow or arrest the process. Okay, we'll move on to complications. So in your book, we just pass page 969 and we're actually, the complications is at the bottom of that page. So I'll try to keep you tuned in to the page number as well. But I'm kind of going through, I've got three things here that I'm looking at uh, to help understand. Don't forget in your book to look at the pharmacologic capsule and cultural considerations and some teaching. There's also uh, some good information about insulin in your boxes. So don't forget about those because a lot of good information's in there. So uh, the pharmacologic capsule, uh, pharmacologic use of glu glucocorticoids can elevate blood glucose. Now that's interesting. So steroids, if you're on steroids, especially long-term, that can lead to hyperglycemia. Although unlikely to cause diabetes in people with normal pancreatic function, glucocorticoid therapy may mask latent diabetes. It also complicates management of known diabetes. So that's interesting, I think. So let's move on to our microvascular complications like uh, CHD and uh, CVA, so heart disease, CVA, peripheral vascular disease are two to four times higher in diabetic patients. So here are some neuropathic complications. And in your book, it talks about retinopathy and nephropathy. So uh, let's talk about that for a minute. So what does that mean? Eyes and nerves, right? So um, retinopathy is pathological changes in the retina that are associated with diabetes and nephropathy is kidney damage, All right? And among people 25 to 74 years of age, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness. Diabetes is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States. Factors that contribute to the development of nephropathy or kidney damage include poor control of glucose. So it's really important if you do have diabetes to keep that glucose and I'm going to say one more thing, the hemoglobin A1C. We're going to talk about that a lot. That's a blood test that measures is a three month long, how long, how is your body managing your glucose in the three months? So that could tell your doctor a lot about how well you are doing. So hemoglobin A1C, and it's on this slide, I'll get to that. So um, neuropathic complications, neuropathy, there's three kinds here. So we've got the uh, neuropathy, pathological changes in nerve tissue called neuropathy. I'm on page 971, by the way, here. Um, and we've got 
Mononeuropathy affects a single nerve or group of nerves, results from an adequate blood supply, and has experienced a sharp stabbing pain. Polyneuropathy. Um, let me just read these here for a second, and then I think it's on the next page. I have more information. Um, we talk about hypo... Well, it doesn't hurt to do it twice, does it? So polyneuropathy involves sensory and autonomic nerves. So sensory polyneuropathy commonly affects both legs symmetrically. Symptoms range from tingling, numbness, and burning. Then there's autonomic neuropathy. Autonomic neuropathy affects the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So it can also affect pupils, pupillary response, and functions of the cardiovascular and GI system. So I thought this was interesting about the GI being affected because I think I've told you stories of gastroparesis, great word to know, by the way. Uh, Patients with diabetes do get gastroparesis. Their stomach just doesn't empty. And that's part of a diabetic syndrome. And the story that I had to go with that, piggyback into that, was the, the pill for, you know, the, the GI pill that they swallow with the camera. So that patient that I had that swallowed the pill, he kept complaining of being bloated and having stomach pain well because he was diabetic and he had gastroparesis and when i saw him 24 hours after giving him that pill that pill was still in his stomach 24 hours later no wonder he had problems and was uncomfortable my goodness all right so we were talking about the gastroparesis in your book page 971 um, also, hypoglycemic unawareness. What is that? Well, normally patients recognize signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia uh, so they can take corrective action. But with hypoglycemic unawareness, the usual symptoms of, this is important, the usual symptoms of tachycardia, palpitations, tremor, sweating, and nervousness, which are usual symptoms of hypoglycemia, aren't seen or aren't felt by this patient. So those early warning systems, they aren't in this patient, the hypoglycemic unawareness patient. So what presents with them is the mental status change. So be aware. Now we have learned so many diseases. Restlessness can also be lack of oxygen. Now we're finding out it can be hypoglycemia too. It can be so many things. That's why we are detectives. We have to find out the real reason of what's going on with this patient. But you've got to know the possibilities. So important to know all these things. So we can help our patients. Uh, then foot complications of diabetes. Well, because they have the peripheral neuropathy, um, they can't feel injuries to their feet. So sometimes these injuries can go untreated and then they get infected and then it's hard to treat an infected patient because there's so much sugar in the bloodstream it just feeds infection, right? Breeds it, feeds it. All right. Now I also have here a uh, long term you should keep a blood glucose in normal range, the hemoglobin A1C should be less than 7%. I can't get these pages there. So there we go. All right. Um, on your next page, which is page 972, you'll see another patient teaching do's and don'ts regarding foot care. That's important. Um, not smoking is important. Why? Well, we've learned that smoking is a vasoconstrictor, which decreases blood flow everywhere. Um, <laughs> there's your walk barefoot. Can't do that. 
even in the house. But that's only with diabetes. So um, prevention of long-term uh, complications, that's where keeping your hemoglobin A1C in check. Um, it also talks about um, tight control of glucose. I have another story. So I had a friend. He was older. I mean, he was mature, like, well, I don't know if you think I'm mature, but this was in the more mature stages of my life. And he had diabetes. He'd had it since he was a kid. And he would give his insulin injections through his shirt. Can you imagine how appalled I was when I saw that? Because I know you're supposed to clean the area with alcohol, right? You're supposed to draw up your insulin and clean the area and wait for it to dry and then inject the insulin. Well, he did it right through his shirt. He never had a problem, and, and he's still living today. He's 68 years old, so he must have been doing a great job, and bless his heart, for doing that um, because he tried to live, and he was a drinker. He liked to drink. He likes to have his cocktail as an older man, um, but still keeping his glucose under control. So think about that. That's pretty amazing to try to live a normal life, but being an insulin dependent diabetic. All right, let's move on. So, okay, here, let's just repeat about microvascular complications. The retinopathy, pathologic changes in the retina associated with diabetes. Nephropathy, kidney damage, Another misspelling, sorry. Diabetes is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease. Factors that contribute to the develop of nephropathy, poor control of blood glucose, and that's where that checking the, in, checking the glucose levels. Think how many times that you go check your patient's glucose with a finger stick. That is so important. It's such an important job of keeping your patient's glucose under control. Patients don't like it. They don't like to be stuck. I know you don't like it and it's probably boring, but it's so important. And then hypertension, long-standing diabetes, genetic susceptibility. These are all contribute to nephropathy or nephro uh, and neuropathic complications. Okay. Accelerated atherosclerotic changes in person with diabetes. Those are complications. Accelerated, so they might have heart disease earlier in their life. And it's associated with coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular accidents, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. Vessels affected by atherosclerosis. These are the most commonly affected vessels. Another misspelling, Debbie? Sorry, guys. Peripheral, carotid, cerebral, and coronary blood vessels. You know, when I do these slides, I, re I do read through them, and I make them, and I read through them again, and I still don't catch some of these mistakes, so I really apologize, but you know where I'm going with all this. Okay, keeping it real. So some neuropathic complications, um, the mononeuropathy, I know this is repetitive again, uh, inadequate blood supply to a single nerve or group of nerves, sharp stabbing pain, polyneuropathy, numbness, burning to loss of sensation, man. Autonomic neuropathy affects sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, GI symptoms, gastroparesis, and constipation. And then I did talk about the hypoglycemic awareness, unawareness. I won't go through that again, but um, it is important to know about. And the foot complications, and I'm here I'm talking about uh, that teaching box on page 972. 
And remember, the best treatment for foot injuries is preventing it, not have it happen at all. Be sure the patient takes care of their feet, wears shoes, slippers, so they don't get an injury. Okay, diabetes control and complications trial, which is the DCCT. It's uh, people that keep track of these things. Um, found that intensive treatment of type 1 diabetes delayed the onset or slowed the progress of ret diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. I like saying those. So what that means in simple English is tight control. Keep it under control and you'll delay the progression of more problems. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But when there's so much candy laying around and extra food and carb and you have to count your carbs and your proteins and when we get into diet, um, it's hard. I know it's hard. So what medications are recommended for patients with increased cardiovascular risks? Well, I left a little space there for you to guess. Aspirin, the blood thinner, and ACE inhibitors. Those would be medications that a diabetic patient would be put on. And then... Um, the American Diabetes Association recommends the blood pressure should be less than 140 systolic and less than 90 diastolic. Total cholesterol, less than 200. LDL, less than 100. HDL, greater than 50. Triglycerides, less than 150. And hemoglobin A1C, less than seven per and that is percent these are all percents sorry okay acute emergencies so first one hypoglycemia Taking too much insulin, that could be a reason why you have hypoglycemia. You took too much insulin and didn't eat. You didn't eat enough food or not eating at the right time. Or you have gastroparesis, so you just feel full and you don't eat. So I'm going to give you a little rule, the 15-15 rule. And that is where, and it, it isn't stated as such, but it's an easy way to remember. And that's 15 grams of quick acting carbohydrates. Then wait 15 minutes and see if it helped. Raise the glucose. Now some examples of a quick acting carbohydrate would be, well, we know orange juice, right? And apple juice. But really important for you to remember is another source, and that's eight ounces, well, that's a glass, of skim milk. That can also be a good example of quick-acting carbos. Also, a tablespoon of sugar or honey. You might even have some um, injectable glucagon, or um, I believe there's a squeeze tube of glucose that you can also give. But eight ounces of skim milk, I mean, if you're at home, you're not in a facility, maybe skim milk is what you've got. And that's a good thing to take. All right, um, they should have injectable glucagon on hand though. Diabetic ketoacidosis, well, this is important to know. So what is it exactly? DKA. It's also called DKA. It's a life-threatening emergency. It's caused uh, by a relative or absolute deficiency of insulin. 
It's a disorder in carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Early signs and symptoms. Anorexia. Oh, I keep itching my face right there, sorry. Um, anorexia, headache, and fatigue. Also classic symptoms, the PPP. Polydipsia, polyuria, polyphasia. Now, if untreated, patient becomes dehydrated, the polyuria, and also because of the concentration of glucose um, in the blood and going through the kidneys. Remember when I kind of went through that earlier? Uh, they become weak, lethargic, with abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Classic fruity breath. Now, if you've ever smelled a fruity breath from a patient uh, with diabetes, you will realize what that smells like. I mistakenly, I will say, one time I had a patient that was diabetic and had liver disease. They both give off an unusual breath. I thought this patient was coming in for an EGD and was NPO and was probably, you know, had too much insulin or maybe he had not taken his insulin right that day, not eaten and had a fruity breath but it was really his liver disease. <laughs> so just be aware that um, there are different breaths, which is interesting. So let me just say again, if diabetic ketoacidosis goes untreated, the patient becomes weak, lethargic, could have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, have fruity breath. Also of importance, they have increased respiratory rate, like that Kussmaul's respirations, increased respiratory rate, <laughs> tachycardia, blurred vision, hypothermia. So their temperature is low. So uh, I hope you remember those things. Again, I'll repeat, tachycardia, blurred vision, hypothermia, tachycardia, uh, the rapid respiratory rate. Now, just try to remember that. I was going to say something I forgot. Okay. Late signs of uh, ketoacidosis, diabetic DKA, the Kussmaul's respirations where you have air hunger. Uh, they could go into a coma and shock. Death can result from DKA. And that is three main problems that they get into. And that is dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and acidosis. That's why I think that fruity breath with the um, liver patients and the kidney and the uh, diabetic patients is that acidosis breath, really. Again, with the diabetic ketoacidosis. All right. Medical emergency, disorder of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Early signs, anorexia, headache, and fatigue. As condition progresses, <laughs> classic symptoms of PPP or polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. If untreated, the patient becomes dehydrated, weak, and lethargic has abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, fruity breath, increased respiratory rate, tachycardia, hypothermia, and blurred vision. And you can see the sequence of events on page 973 under diabetic ketoacidosis. And it goes through all that information again. For the third time, must be important. Okay, now hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome. 
HHNS. Patient has extremely high glucose greater than 600 and goes into a coma, but has no evidence of ketones, no ketone spilling in the urine. The patient's pancreas is just able to secrete just enough insulin to prevent the breakdown of fatty acids. So that's why no ketones. A lack of effective insulin or the inability to use available insulin. So that's the HHNS. A patient's persistent state of hyperglycemia causes osmotic diuresis, resulting in loss of fluid and electrolytes. So what happens? The fluid shifts from intracellular fluid to extracellular space, fluid following the sodium, and they present with dehydration and hypernatremia. So that's important to remember. And not only is dehydration and hypernatremia important to remember, remember water follows salt. So you, those two are always tied in together. And this can be seen with patients with TPN. Remember TPN, uh, to, total parenteral nutrition, high glucose. It's usually like a D20, D15, D10. Um, so it's a high glucose and, and it's not put peripherally. It's put into a central line. And dialysis, they filter out, they have a diacylate and they filter out all the um, waste products from the, from the um, blood. But they re, what they return, if they return it um, in this state, it, it could cause the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state because they're taking out also along with those uh, waste products, they take out um, the electrolytes too. So it, sometimes they have to replace them during dialysis. That's why a dialysis nurse really needs to draw a lot of blood and be on top of the patient's uh, situation. So remember uh, dehydration, hyponatremia, and remember it can occur during uh, receiving TPN and during dialysis. All right, medical diagnosis of uh, diabetes. I know this kind of goes roundabout way, doesn't it? it seems to follow in the book a little different. Uh, so medical diagnosis here on page 975. The normal fasting serum glucose level is 70 to 100. So criteria for diabetes, fasting glucose is greater than 126. Now that may be type two, right? Hemoglobin A1C is greater than 6.5. PPP, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia, unexplained weight loss. A two-hour postprandial glucose, that's what um, our pregnancy, our pregnant women do get the two-hour uh, postprandial glucose. Or if you checked, what that means is after they eat, postprandial means two hours after they eat, their glucose is greater than 200. So pre-diabetes fasting glucose uh, is from 100 to 125. The glucose tolerance uh, test is 140 to 190. Hemoglobin A1C, this is prediabetes, 5.7 to 6.4. So that's just a little general information there. So let's go to medical treatment. Nutrition specifically. So nutrition, and this is on page 975, Nutrition is very important. It's essential that they be on proper nutrition. Might even need a nutritionist, a dietitian, to come and talk to the patient to be sure that they are 
eating correctly and getting the proper amount of carbohydrates, fats, and protein. That's why it's important to look at what your patient ate on the tray. The goal of diabetic diet is to maintain plasma glucose as near to normal as possible. Persons should coordinate insulin with mealtime. That's why you give insulin, you hurry up and get that blood sugar and you give that insulin before breakfast. Uh, distribute food intake throughout the day to avoid large concentration of calories, carbohydrates, and sugar. So eat small meals, or at least be sure you do it at the same time. So see nutrition box on page 975. Uh, this talks about nutrition considerations. I said page 296, that's not right. I don't know why I put that there. It's 978. I'm losing my mind, folks. Being all alone, I'm losing my mind. Don't you feel that way? Sorry. All right, at least I'm here to face it up, right? My face is here, I've gotta face all these misspellings and Miss Pages. But I do have C Nutrition Box, page 975 up there. So I did give that page right. All right. Um, but in this Nutrition Considerations on page 975, so it says how essential diet is in the management of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The goal of diabetic Diet is to maintain plasma glucose as near to normal as possible. A person who requires insulin to control diabetes should coordinate insulin with meal times. I know I've put that on the page, but I'm just going to this nutrition consideration box. Um, diet plans are individualized per patient, per person, according to their weight and activity. Um, when hypoglycemia is attributed to an overproduction of insulin in response to carbohydrate ingestion, a low carbohydrate, high protein diet with small meals may control the condition. Now, the thing that's hard about diet is the patient needs to be controlled, right? They can't go eat what they wanna eat when they wanna eat it. So, that's what's hard for patients. They can't eat what they want to eat. It needs to be, you know, there's a lot of hidden sugar in foods. So they need to be aware of what they can have and what they can't have. All right. Medical treatment, more medical treatment. Exercise this time. So it's very effective treatment. Remember, in type 2, they're going to try diet and exercise first. So this is very effective for patients with diabetes. Uh, exercising muscles uses glucose at 20 times the rate of a muscle at rest. So good for us, right? We need to exercise. Maybe we can lose some of this weight we've gained. Um, sitting here during this COVID crisis. I know I've gained some weight. Got to cut back. Quit eating ice cream. All right. Hyperglycemia may occur with exercise in a patient with type 1 when insulin is inadequate. Excess release of counter-regulatory hormones and mobilization of free fatty acid results in ketone production, which can lead to DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, from the acids results in ketone production. All right, so on page 977, it talks about the importance of exercise, which I need you to remember. It also talks about exercise and diabetes, it has a patient teaching page, which I really like. 
um, excessive exercises. Here's one thing to remember too, though, is that excessive exercise. So let's say you have diabetes and you want to lose weight. Well, that's great, but excessive exercise uses up glucose. Now, what about the insulin? Are you going to need more insulin or less insulin? Well, if you're using up glucose that you have, you'll need less insulin. So it's really important to balance that exercise, checking your glucose from time to time. Maybe you're running a marathon. Think about diabetics running a marathon, right? So they're using all this muscles and breakdown and glucagon and glucose and gluconeogenolysis is occurring in their body while they're running. So do they need insulin? Are they going to have to, in the middle of a marathon, give themselves some insulin? Well, maybe these people have a pump, uh, insulin pump, so they don't have to. Their body just recognizes that they need it. That would be good. But maybe that's not always true. So hyperglycemia may occur with exercise in patient with type 1 diabetes when insulin levels are inadequate. I think that's interesting. So also on page 977, it talks about an appropriate combination of aerobic and anaerobic exercises should be determined and remember aerobic exercise produces the most therapeutic effect the patient should exercise for 30 to 60 minutes th three to four times a week yes we should yes we should um, these include activities like weightlifting yoga and sit-ups i don't know if anybody's done orange theory but I haven't, but I understand it's great to do. And you can do that at home. There's an app. You can just do it on your phone. Insulin therapy. All patients with type 1 need insulin injections, and some with type 2 eventually need it. Now, so since we're talking about insulin, there's different types of insulin. There's human insulin, there's beef insulin, and pork insulin. Now, if you have an allergy to pork, you don't want to take pork insulin. So that's why there are different types of insulin. You want to note allergies always with your patients, right? Um, there's rapid acting insulin, short acting insulin, intermediate acting, and long acting the physician will prescribe the type of insulin needed by the patient. Um, all rapid acting and short acting are clear, but humulin R, oh, I, wa I wanted you to note that humulin R peaks in two hours, and that's in on page 979 where it's talking about uh, the different types of insulins and their peak. So the um, wrap the humulin R peaks in two hours. I drew a, drew a little line on mine, um, and you can see it. The very peak of that insulin activity is the note regular insulin. All right. All other insulins except Lantus and Levomir are cloudy. It's important to remember, especially when you're mixing. And when you're mixing clear to cloudy, cloudy to clear. And I also have for you to see table 50.1, which is your drug therapy, insulin preparations, and time course of action. And again, notice that that regular insulin humulin R peaks. So they have an onset. Well, first of all, they have appearance. So if it's clear or cloudy, onset, and with the humulin R, it's um, 30 minutes to an hour. The peak is two to three hours, 
and then the duration is five to eight hours. That's interesting, is it not? So it's important when you're giving insulin to your patients, though, that you know uh, what you're giving and when it starts working because is their breakfast coming right away? I hope they don't have to wait too long. And what about if they're scheduled for a procedure and they're not eating at all because they're NPO? Do you give the same amount of insulin? Well, your doctor will write an order about that, but if they haven't written an order, be sure you ask him. I do believe they um, give half the insulin because you can't totally stop it, but um, the doctor will write that order. All my pages just fell down. All right. Let me see here. If there's anything else I want to tell you here. Okay, just remember exercise is important and the thing about exercise too if I did not make that clear is that you want to exercise patient diabetic patient should exercise the same time and the same intensity every day so that's uh, important to know same time and intensity uh, daily. Uh, remember clear to cloudy. Remember short acting insulin, humulin R. Um, and remember to look at that table. Okay. A few more things about insulin. So the root. I thought this was interesting. I put this in here. It's not in your book, but I found this out. There is an intranasal insulin, but it's not used because it's so expensive. In fact, it's $300 for four units. Can you imagine that? And that will, probably is not covered by insurance because that's just way over the top. So it's not used. You won't see it um, maybe someday, but it's good that you know about it, isn't it? Knowledge is power. So there's oral root. So insulin can't be given orally, but there or, there's oral hypoglycemics, but there's not oral insulin. Uh, it's given sub-Q, so all insulins are given sub-Q. It can be given IV, but only regular insulin can be given IV. Why? Well, because it acts right away. So that's why you're giving it IV, because you want it to act right away. So we're gonna only give the regular. It's more controlled that way. We're gonna give it a uh, regular intravenous. All right, uh, concentration. So you've probably just seen the U100. You might see U50s. So be sure though that you match your syringe with your insulin. So if it says a U100 insulin, you need to use a U100 syringe. Now, that's the most common you'll see. You, there is a U500. It's used only in emergencies or patients that are insulin resistant. Now, there's pre-mixed insulin. I think that's kind of nice. I don't like mixing insulins myself, but sometimes we have to. Uh, but premixed insulin contains regular and NPH, and it's easy to prepare, so there's less chance for error. Um, so there's 70 30, that's 70 of NPH and 30 of regular. There's 50 50, which is 50 NPH and 50 regular. And then there's 75 25 which is 75% NPH and 25% Lispro. So you do need to know uh, the premixed insulin 70, 30. And what does that mean? Okay. 
This is just a picture, it's in your book, of the sites of insulin. I know we, we always think of the abdomen and the arms, but remember we do need to rotate um, because the patients can get little nodules and they get bruises sometimes. Some nurses may not give it so well, so they do get bruises and maybe the patient's sensitive or on an uh, anticoagulant. It's not always the nurse's fault, I shouldn't say that. Um, but just be careful to rotate sites and that's why you document the site so that the nurses don't always give it on the same site. So if you're giving it in the right arm one time, give it in the left arm the next time. So, and I know there's a place to document where you give it um, on the med sheet. Also, don't forget the legs. And sometimes when patients are sitting in the wheelchair, it's really easy to get to their legs. So, well, unless they, are, they have their clothes on, then it's not so easy, is it? All right, this is just the insulin side. And this again is, I just put a little arrow there um, on the regular insulin peaking. That's in your book. Um, I do want to say one more thing before we go into the oral hyperglycemics, and that is that, and I mentioned it briefly about patients that are NPO. So the preprandial or before meal doses of insulin are adjusted for caloric content of the meals that have been prescribed for the patient, right? But you need to hold the insulin if they're NPO and document that you held it. Maybe you held it because their glucose was too low already. And you want, might want to call the physician about that as well. Especially if you're treating something, you always need to let the doctor know. Right? And I uh, just want to reiterate also two types uh, that can be mixed in one syringe. You need to know those types. And remember clear to cloudy. And what are the steps for mixing two types of insulin in the same syringe? Inject air first, draw up the insulins, clear cloudy. And know that the rate of absorption from the abdomen is 50% faster from the thighs. That's interesting. All right. Just wanted to say a few more things before we moved on. I don't think I talked about the insulin pump, though. Um, so you can see in your picture there on page 981 of a patient with the insulin pump. It's pretty cool. Uh, I knew a lady who had the, uh, got pregnant. When she was pregnant, she got diabetes type 1, and then it did after she had the baby advance to type 2, and she got an insulin pump. And uh, it was pretty great for her with two little kids to have the pump. Um, looks like a pager, battery driven, needles inserted subcutaneously. You can read about this. It's very interesting. Uh, the patient calculates the bolus based on self-monitored blood glucose levels. Every two to three days, the syringe needle and tubing are replaced. The advantage is that patients do not have to ha use intermediate acting or long acting insulin. Uh, when there are uncertain fluctuations in glucose. So read through that on page 981. And then we get to the oral hypoglycemics, anti-hyperglycemics. I love the way they do that. Really confuse the heck out of us. So type 2 diabetes uh, who are unable, diabetics who are unable to control their blood glucose with nutrition and exercise. So if you have type 2, first of all, they're going to try to treat you, keep your glucose under tight control with nutrition and exercise. Got to drink water. All right. But if you can't, they're going to put you on some oral hypo, 
hyperglycemics. Now the first one they talk about is sulfonylureas. And those lower blood sugar with new, uh, excuse me, lower blood sugar by stimulating the pancreas to make more insulin. And I also have here, it's not used that often. The next one is alpha glucosidase. They delayed the digestion of complex carbohydrates into glucose. And it may be used in conjunction with insulin. So sometimes not just an oral pill is enough for some people. And these oral hypoglycemics, uh, hyperglycemics would be a carbose or miglitol. And then there's something called biguanides, and those decrease glucose production by liver by the liver. That's more common that you would recognize metformin or glucophage. And then there's thiozolidinadionase. <laughs> Try that 10 times. So what that does is it increases the uptake of glucose by skeletal muscle and fat tissue. And that is in your book on page 982. This is actose. You may have heard of that, Avandia. Now at the bottom of that section there, before we get to the next one, um, it says patients should be aware that these drugs decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. They are contraindicated with class three or four heart failure and during pregnancy. So what you need to remember here is that patients should be aware that these drugs decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives, and that's like Actos or Avandia, okay? All right. So complications of therapy on page 983. So, hypoglycemia is a complication because excess insulin is given. Now, that could be because inadequate food intake, delayed or missed meals. Like if a patient's NPO, but you gave the insulin by accident, or the patient ate something, what is, and they don't have anything to counteract it, and then they have a rebound hypoglycemia. Have you ever eaten something really sugary and kind of gotten a little bit of a high from it, and then you crash with hypoglycemia and get really tired and weak, right? Well, that's kind of the way they feel. But if they have hypoglycemia and they are diabetic, they need some form of glucose right away. So remember, like the milk, the sugar, the honey, glucose, of um, orange juice, glucagon, something like that. Um, all right. So just remember that they do need some sort of glucose right away. The next thing I want to talk about is the Samoji phenomenon. You do need to know about this not only for me, for taking care of patients, but also NCLEX, you're gonna probably find it, okay? Samoji phenomenon, where too much insulin can cause hyperglycemia. That's interesting. Well, it's a phenomenon. It's not something normally that happens, right? It's characterized by rebound hyperglycemia that occurs in response to hypoglycemia. That's kind of the opposite of what I was just talking about. Because remember, this is a phenomenon. It's something unusual that occurs. So, 
The Samoji phenomenon, this is like the last, well, it's the second paragraph under Samoji phenomenon at the bottom of page, my 983, uh, but I also have it on the slide. Um, it should be suspected when, let me tell you, this is important to know, awakening with a headache and complains of restless sleep. This is a diabetic, not just you and me. Uh, nightmares in your recess. Now that's an important word to know. E N U R E S I S. Involuntary avoiding during sleep. Yeah, kind of like your kid or a baby. Uh, nausea and vomiting. These are symptoms. The blood glucose records reflect fluctuation uh, between hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Uh, to confirm suspected Samoji phenomenon, the patient's blood glucose needs to be measured between 2 and 4 a.m. and again at 7 a.m. So that would be something you need to talk to your the physician about. Next thing I wanted to mention, unusual thing, is dawn phenomenon. And that is some people with diabetes who are insulin dependent experience an increase in fasting blood glucose levels between 5 and 9. So in the dawn of the morning, they get hypoglycemic. Interesting, dawn phenomenon. All right, nursing care of the patient with diabetes. So we're gonna do a good focused assessment. We're going to talk to them, why are they here, right? We're gonna look at them, we're gonna check their INO, how have they been eating? What kind of medication are they on? The history that they have had um, present illnesses. Remember, if they have an illness, an infection, it requires, it's going to take more of their glucose to, to get better, but it also can make it worse if they have a high, high hyperglycemia. So insulin is going to have to be given maybe more when they have an infection or a fever. Uh, we want to know their family history. We want to go through their review of symptoms. Their vision is important to discuss because we know diabetes affects vision. We know it affects their kidneys. So we got to talk to them about those things. Their functional assessment. How do they take care of themselves? Are they taking good care of themselves? Are they cleaning their feet good and drying between the toes? Remember that's a big thing uh, because moisture, things can grow, yeast can grow in a moist situation. So they always want to dry between their toes. Um, their physical exam, we want to check their skin turgor, their hydration status, their blood pressure, weight, vital signs. Uh, we want to check their eyes, their feet, be sure and check their feet discoloration, edema, any wound, any uh, pain or unusual infections or wound that you happen to see that they may not even know that they have because they don't have feeling there. So quite intense uh, exam. So these are just some nursing diagnoses, some interventions that might occur that you can use your nursing care plan. Ineffective management of diabetes, their glucose is not in control. Family stress, stress is going to require more glucose, more usage of their glucose. So that would be one. There are some really great care plans here on in your book. I'm looking at them, type 
patient with type 1 diabetes, and a patient with type 2 diabetes. So uh, potential for fluid volume deficit, the urinating too much frequently, uh, potential for injury because they can't may not be able to feel, reduced activity tolerance, they don't feel like it, they're too tired, they have fatigue, or maybe they just don't want to exercise, chronic pain, that nephropathy, neuropathy can uh, give them increased pain. Potential for disrupted skin integrity. They might get injured easily. Uh, potential for acute confusion with hypoglycemia. Uh, also, inadequate coping. How are they coping with their problems? They might not be coping well with becoming a diabetic. Okay, let's look at, and I know this sounds like a repeat, but it is in your book. So on the bottom of page 990, it is a big header called hypoglycemia. So know the pathophysiology of hypoglycemia. The causes of hypoglycemia may be divided into three categories, exogenous, endogenous, and functional. So that's on page 991. Exogenous hypoglycemia results from outside factors acting on the body to produce a low blood glucose. These include insulin, hypo oral hypoglycemic agents, alcohol, or exercise. Endogenous hypoglycemia occurs when internal factors cause an excessive secretion of insulin. So that's important for you to know. Um, that is on page 991, where it starts exogenous hypoglycemia. So that paragraph is a need to know. All right, uh, let's go to signs and symptoms. So that's important. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia vary according to how quickly the blood glucose levels are falling. Uh, when the levels fall rapidly, epinephrine, cortisol, glucagon, and growth hormone are secreted by the body to increase glucose levels. Adrenergic symptoms that result from these physiological responses include weakness, Hunger, diaphoresis, tremors, anxiety, irritability, confusion, and dizziness. And I have those on this slide. Those are important to know. Another thing that's interesting is under medical diagnosis, the Whipple's triad. So Whipple's triad is the presence of symptoms, documentation of low blood sugar when symptoms occur, an improvement of these symptoms when glucose rises. So that's Whipple's triad. So an, another important thing is the 1515 rule. I mentioned that before. So it's under medical treatment on page 991. Um, it says the patient with milder forms of hypoglycemia is treated following the 1515 rule. 15 grams of carbohydrates, wait 15 minutes, and then retest. If the carbohydrate, if the patient's condition does not improve, another 15 grams of carbohydrates should be given. Uh, giving more than 15 grams initially may lead to repound hyperglycemia. And remember that uh, a glass of milk, eight ounces of milk, a cup of milk is a good treatment for hypoglycemia. So remember that 1515 rule, it's a good one. A nursing care of the patient with diabetes mellitus. I told you this is a never ending lecture, but I am close to the end. All right, so uh, focused assessment, their health history, why are they here, um, their past history of any illnesses or present illnesses their past history, their physical exam.
and your interventions. This would be your nursing diagnosis, their lack of knowledge. Do they know even know what to do when they're hyper or hypoglycemic? Their potential for injury. Hypoglycemic is at risk for injury as a result of weakness and dizziness. They have to keep monitoring themselves. Then the ineffective management of hypoglycemia. They need uh, some emotional support for the patient with hypoglycemia is necessary during diagnosis and treatment. So this is a life changer to get di the diagnosis of diabetes. It changes the way you exercise, the way you eat, what you can eat, where you, you know. And I, face it, we live around food. We congregate around food. We socialize with food and drink. So a diabetic can have several glasses of wine. That has to be counted in to the amount of calories that they take. So it's a life changer. All right. Well, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope this was helpful. Let's try a question. When insulin is absent, glucose cannot be transported from the bloodstream to the cells, and this causes the patient to experience what? I'll give you a minute. So the correct answer is B, because glucose can't be transported from the bloodstream to the cells. It stays in the bloodstream. So the rationale, let me tell you. So insulin stimulates the active transport of glucose into the cells. When insulin is absent, glucose cannot enter most cells, so it remains in the bloodstream. The blood then becomes thick with glucose, which increases its osmolality. osmolality. Increased osmolality stimulates the thirst center causing the patient to be to experience polydipsia and take in additional fluid. So answer B. Okay, let's try another question. That's it. Which of the following is not a risk factor for type 2 diabetes? Give you a second. Not a risk factor. So the answer is A, according to the National Diabetes Information Clearinghouse, NDIC, which is part of the NIH, risk factors for type 2 diabetes include the following, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, family history of diabetes, age 40 years and older, history of gestational diabetes, history of delivering infant weighing more than 10 pounds, ethnicity derived from Alaska Native, American Indian, African American, Hispanic, Latino, Asian American or Pacific Islander, polycystic ovary syndrome, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and presence of acanthosis nigrans or other conditions. All right, uh, study hard, and I will talk to you later. Have a great day.